We live in a world where ordinary people can hire fake paparazzi to follow them around to make them look famous. Where high school students physically attack classmates and post YouTube videos of the beatings to get attention. Our next guest sees these events as part of a rise in narcissism. And joining us now to tell us how we can stop it, here's Keith Campbell, psychologist and co-author of The Narcissism Epidemic, which W. Keith Campbell co-authored with Gene M. Twenge a number of years ago. And we're glad to have you back for part two. Great, thanks for our conversation me. on this. Okay, here's the quote. You have to love yourself before loving someone else. You've heard that before. Yes. Isn't that true? No, no. <laughs> no. People who love themselves are manipulative and often unfaithful and self-absorbed and make very poor partners. Um, I don't know where that came from. I mean, I can guess where it came from, but I don't know who first originated that quote. But if I said, you know, you want to love others, I'd say, just go love others. You don't have to love yourself to do don't, that. Don't start loving, don't spend a bunch of time in a closet <laughs> looking in a mirror saying I love you. Just go love somebody else. Well, here's the line from your book. Self-admiration was not always a core American idea. So where did it Sneak begin? in. Yeah. Sneak in. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it's even with self-esteem, it, it, when you go back, it always was something people thought was a mixed blessing. You know, it's, you've got to have some confidence to sell stuff in the, in the, in the marketplace. I mean, that's what Adam Smith said, you know. You've got to have some confidence, but at the same time, too much becomes prideful, and, and then you become a bad person. You become somebody nobody wants to associate with. So it's always a, a mixed blessing. Um, in the 60s, we had this huge, almost a romantic movement. People focused on finding themselves and you know, sort of these depth experiences. And in about 1970, that transitioned into self-esteem. So instead of um, sort of self-understanding or self-knowledge, it became esteeming yourself in, in a weird way. It's almost like in Maslow's, you know, talk about Maslow's hierarchy still, you know, Maslow had this hierarchy of needs with self-actualization being at the top of the pyramid and then self-esteem below, below that. Mm -hmm. It's almost like we went from the top of the pyramid, which is really hard, being an actualized person, being all you can be, um, to somebody who just like themselves. Well, okay, so self-actualization is different from self-esteem and narcissism in what, yeah. in what respect? Self-actualization actually involved work. So when they talked about self-actualization, you know, the example that, uh, like Maslow gave, you know, Abraham Lincoln. You, you, you have a, a range of possibilities in your life and you achieve some of those. And it's hard and most people don't do it. Self-esteem is much easier because there's no doing it part. You just have to like yourself and like yourself despite everything else. And then that message started, the first book on self-esteem was I think 69 or 70. And people started focusing on that. And then in 1980 in the US, we in, in California, we decided it was good for the children. <laughs> so we had the self-esteem movement and, and, and it was also the self-esteem and social responsibility because Republicans wanted that piece in there. And we thought, let's give kids self-esteem, it'll make them better, it'll solve all these cultural problems. The data never bore that out, but the ideas stuck around. What was the first book in 1969? It was the, uh, how was it? The, it was by uh, Nathaniel Brandon. Um, okay, I was starting to think it was, I'm okay, you're okay. No, that's, not, that, that's later. That, that was later, and I, I can't remember who that was by. It was like transactive psych. Anyway, it was Nathaniel Brandon, who was actually a, had a relationship with Ayn Rand. I mean, it was a very interesting huh. history to, to. Control room, we're going to Google it, and they'll let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Let That's me, great. you're too young to remember the me decade, aren't you? You never lived through it. I mean, you were well, alive for it, but you weren't. I uh, wasn't really, no, I was not living the kid. dream. Yeah. <laughs> you were not living the yeah. dream. So I will assist you here, Professor, with, um, this is a little bit of Tom Wolfe, writing in New York Magazine in 1976 in a piece called The Me Decade and the Third Great Awakening. Here's our excerpt. But once the dreary little bastards started getting money in the 1940s, they did an astonishing thing. They took their money and ran. They did something only aristocrats and intellectuals and artists were supposed to do. They discovered and started doting on me. They've created the greatest age of individualism in American history. All rules are broken. The profits are out of business. Where the third great awakening will lead, who can presume to say? One only knows that the great religious waves have a momentum all their own. Neither arguments nor policies nor acts of the legislature have been any match for them in the past. And this one has the mightiest, holiest role of all, the beat that goes, me, 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 me. Okay, yeah. where did all of this self-exploration of the 60s and 70s go wrong? 
Well, I think, you know, when he was writing about that, it, was, it starts off with somebody in, in the Est movement, you know, sort of expressing themselves. And what was his name? Werner Erhardt? Oh, that was the one who started the movement. Yeah. This was, a, and it actually been focused on somebody in a um, in one of the S seminars, um, ex sort of expressing himself or herself in a very dramatic way, um, and and that was there was a narcissism in that in terms of finding your own path in life. And this, anyway, this goes back to you know if you remove sort of standard social values, standard moral values, standard values of what a good person is, and then where do you find meaning? Well, you find it in the self. And so he was really catching on to that, that phase of looking inward to find the truth, looking inward to find meaning, which is narcissistic. We don't do that anymore. People are not, one of the biggest changes we've seen culturally is people don't look for a personal meaning, a personal philosophy of life, because they already have it. And now we just have expression. It's just unmediated expression of self. There isn't even the search. So we've gone even beyond you know, what, what uh, Dr. Wolf was talking about to this, this rampant self-expression. Hmm. Let's, we touched on this a little bit yesterday, but let's go a little deeper into this today. Parenting, how has the way people parent changed and created a generation of narcissists? Well, the parenting is interesting. One of the biggest changes we've had is the value of, seen is the value of obedience. In terms of, people have always wanted their kids to do well. Um, I mean, since we've been measuring this stuff. 40s and 50s, um, and even make their own decisions. But the, but the idea that kids need to be obedient has gone away. I mean, that's almost seen as a bad thing because right. you want your kid to, you know, express oneself. Express oneself. And I'm like, say what you feel. Like God, if I said what I felt, I'd be in prison right now. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, you see all the time. You just look at the wreckage of people's lives when they they express themselves. Just go read the newspaper and you see what happens when people express themselves. It's a disaster. But somehow we think it's good for our kids to do that. Um, which is kind of a weird view of Freudian psychology that got channeled for through a few, few, a few, a few, a th anyway, got channeled. <laughs> and, uh, sorry. And, um, and that's what we ended up with. So this idea that kids need to express themselves and do what they want and you don't put boundaries on them. They don't need to obey their parents. I mean, that's been, that's been the, the sort of the parenting piece. There's also been the parallel piece in schools and culture more generally, which I think is, and actually I think that might be more powerful than the parenting. Parenting matters. I mean, we see parents who put their kids on a pedestal or have kids who are more narcissistic um, or dote on their kids too much. So you see that model. Um, well, I wonder why they do that though, because presumably those parents had parents who didn't do that. So they know there's another way to parent. So why are they all of a sudden? I think part of it is, I mean, parents don't, you know, you're a parent, I'm a parent, I assume yeah, you're a parent. Yeah. You don't wake up and you go, I'm gonna screw my kid up. Mm -hmm. My goal is to give my kid everything. And that way, when my kid has to face the real world, I want my kid to collapse. Because he, <laughs> he or she has had every advantage along the way and now will completely fall apart when he or she meets the real world. You don't think that. What you think is the world is really competitive and challenging, and I work hard, and I want my kid to have a lot of good experiences, and I want to give them those advantages along the way so they can get to the best school, and I can help them with a tutor, and I can help them do that, and they won't make any of the mistakes, even the ones I made, and then they will do really well. And the problem is, when, when these children aren't failing, they don't learn how to fail. No they, resiliency skills. You don't learn resilience. You learn resiliency by, by failing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you fail not, not being traumatized. And that's what I always tell teachers. I'm like, make my kid fail, please. Don't traumatize her. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want trauma's bad, but just learn how to fail. Because if you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself hard enough in life. But, but it's not, I don't think parents are bad. I think parents just see it. God, you know, imagine trying to get your kid in the best schools these days. Mm -hmm. You can't fail anymore. Control Room found the answer. Nathaniel Brandon's book was called The Psychology of Self-Esteem. 1969, I guess? 69, 70, something like that? 1969. Okay. There you go. Everything's on Google. Okay, I, I was right by guessing yeah. two numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were there. You were there. Uh, how do you know, if you're a parent though today, it's very hard to know where to draw the line. How do you know when trying to pump up little Johnny or Janie's self-esteem yeah. isn't crossing a line and going into making little Johnny or Janie a, a future narcissist. Well, I think 
there, there's a couple things you can do that are very specific. One is you encourage children to be compassionate or care about others because that's a big buffer against narcissists. I mean, if your kid cares, is a decent person, cares about other people, that's, that's you're not going to end up with a, a super narcissistic child. The second is you can reward kids for effort rather than performance. You say, God, you, you know, the kid comes home with an A. You say, God, you, you worked hard. That's great. I'm proud of you. You worked so hard on that. Rather than saying, you're so smart. And, and there's really interesting research on this. When you give a kid a test and say, God, you got 100 on this. You're so smart. You want to do another test? They say, no. Why would I? <laughs> I'm smart. I don't I'm need smart. to. I'm smart. I'm done. Um, you say you worked hard, then they go, let me do another, because you're, you're being praised for work. You and make the connection between hard work and good result. Yeah, and, and you know how life is. You know, some stuff works, some stuff doesn't. But in general, if you work harder at something, you do better. So All the kids are on some kind of social media nowadays. Yeah. Does Facebook contribute to this? Yes. Um, what we find is that, that people who are, who are narcissistic use Facebook in a way to promote themselves. They have more relationships on Facebook. So if you just count the number of friends on Facebook, narcissism will correlate with that. And that's been found in, in lots of studies since we first looked at this. Um, so it, it, it will be a case when your kid gets on her Facebook page or his Facebook page and they look at the kids who are most connected, who are pushing themselves the most, what they're gonna see is a lot of narcissism. But does it feed it or create it? I think it does both. I think we have the data on, on feeding it, we have very strongly. The data on creating it are less strong. We have some data, we've had people come into a lab, work on their Facebook page, work on their MySpace page. Um, sometimes we found narcissism going up, sometimes we find self-esteem going up. So it's just not as clear and there isn't this great longitudinal data. Um, this is public television, right? It's it is. Talk about data. And, yes, uh, okay. allowed. Okay, yeah. just stop me if I'm get, getting <laughs> too in the weeds. Um, what we don't have are studies following people for long periods of time to say, look, this is, they were here, and then they got on Facebook and went here. I, I, I just don't know. And the other thing is, that just like TV, just like any other uh, medium, uh, Facebook or social networking can be used for all sorts of things. It can be used for having a strong relationship with your family back in India. It can be, at, it can be used for creating a club to help children. It can be help, used to show off and, and get a bunch of attention. So it can be used for narcissism or for other means. I would like to play a clip right now of one of the great philosophers of our time, who also happens to be a pretty funny guy. His name's Louis C.K. Look at the monitor over my shoulder and control room, roll tape, please. Like, I think if Jesus comes back and starts telling everyone everything, it'll just, everybody's just gonna be twittering and they won't be like, I am Christ and I have returned. Oh my God, Jesus is right in front of me, right now. I swear to God. But this is, I'm now going to impart to you, I have a twit pic of Jesus. Oh my God, he's trending. Jesus is trending right now. Uh, okay. I don't have any can idea I just, what Can you said. just look at me for a second? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we've gotten to a point in this world where apparently telling people that you met Jesus is more important than meeting Jesus. What's wrong with us that, today? That was so right on. That, I, I mean, that's terrifying. Um, it's, it actually strikes me as very sad, and I'm in Athens, Georgia, I talk to a lot of musicians, and, and they note this. You go to a concert, and there'll be a bunch of people filming the concert, yeah. watching it through a little screen. And, and it becomes, it almost like the, the desire to tell people you did this is the experience itself. The, the experience isn't being there and being absorbed, it's telling people. Um, there's a couple problems about, with this. One is, the happiest most people are is when they're totally absorbed in something and not thinking about themselves. Mm -hmm. Whether it's with your kid, why, if you're watching your kid do some, you know, little uh, whatever, play piano, and you're crying, that's my child. Taking a picture that breaks that cycle. Um, so it breaks the cycle. It also, it also makes the experience just about getting attention. And so you're thinking, am I getting attention? Am I getting attention and not enjoying it? So it, I, I, it makes me sort of sad in a way that that's how people are growing up. I would have done the same thing, I'm sure, if I were. I mean, I have a, I have a cousin who they, they go, I mean, I grew up in California surfing, 
what they do now is the goal is you go surfing and take pictures of yourself and then show people. So the sport has changed to taking pictures of yourself. I would have been doing the same thing. It seems to me that that takes away part of the experience or at least changes it fundamentally. But you, how many kids you got? Two. How old? Ten and five. Okay, so you've gone to plenty of Christmas concerts and taken yeah. video of your kids singing I've and all that. I've never taken video. You've never taken, you've never done no, that? No, I, I just... What, what do I care? I mean, am I going to, I want to be there and experience it. I'm not going to go back in three days and look at videos and I. It's not for you, it's for them. They're going to look at videos? Absolutely. Really? Take it from me. Really? I, why do they, do you look at videos of yourself? I mean, as a kid? Uh, not so much that, but my kids today love looking at videos of themselves when they were little children. And I happen to have taken a lot of movies of them when they were little children. I don't know if that makes them narcissists. No, I, think it's just, I don't think it's what people do. I just am no. bad. Oh, all right. <laughs> Good. I, I just, We've been talking for 45 minutes. We finally established that. Yeah, no, I'm okay. a bad parent. Um, <laughs> you know, but actually framing it that way is actually very useful. If I could do it and say, look, this is for them, that would make me yeah, do it. That's why I do it. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Let <laughs> My ch children should thank you because now they will have a video. Exactly. Now you should yeah. start taking some video of them so that when yeah. they're 25 or 30, They'll see this video of them when they were 10 and 5, and they'll think, oh, wasn't I cute back then? Dad, you're such a good parent for share, uh, capturing that moment for me angle. forever. That's the angle. <laughs> Always play the angle, sir. Okay. I want to play another clip for you now. This is a guy named Richard Gwynn, who has been a journalist in Canada for about 50 years and writes for the largest circulation newspaper in the country, the Toronto Star. And we talked about this. Uh, when did we do this? We did this, uh, yeah, it was a decade after 9-11, a little more than a decade after 9-11. Uh, talking about, well, it'll speak for itself. Roll tape, please. I would argue today facts are irrelevant. So what's relevant? Facts are yeah. feeling, yeah. feeling. Feeling. There's a brilliant it. comment made by a, 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 uh, an actor, uh, Kanye West. Now don't ask Kanye. Me. Kanye West. Mm -hmm. I'm so out of things, I haven't got a clue who he is, why he's <laughs> famous. But he said, and I thought, I've never seen a more shrewd comment about contemporary nature of our society than this one by Kanye West, which is, the only facts now are feelings. Hmm. And he's right. All debate is about feelings. It is, I feel you have offended me. I feel you have patronized me. And you hmm. cannot defend that. Thoughts? Um, I... I um I think things have changed and become more emotional. I think part of it might be narcissism, but part of it is also, I think the way media, I mean, I almost think it's economic. So if I'm in the, in the business of facts, let's say I'm a journalist, I'm desired to get facts, I'm a scientist, that's expensive, that's hard to do. I've got to fill up airtime, I've got to keep people interested. So why not get rid of that or mind, minimize that and just have a bunch of feelings and debates and argument and then people get really wound up about that. And, um, and it's cheaper. Easier. It's easy and cheap. And that to me seems like a big part of it is just the, the raw economics of how the media cycle works. Hmm. I, I don't know if this is right, but there's fascinating stuff in our country right now with the, with the apparently our government is spying on us, which is shocking. Apparently? Uh, shocking. <laughs> um, and, it, and they've had, you know, they have these, some historical data they've been talking about. They look, you know, when Bush was president, the Republicans thought this was great. The Democrats thought it was awful. Now everybody switched sides. Mm -hmm. And so you go, well, it's not really an intellectual debate. It's not a serious debate about liberty and freedom and all that. This is just emotion. This is just my team and your team. So I, I can see that even now. Um, I think a lot of it's just money. Let's follow up looking ahead. Your book's called The Narcissism Epidemic. If this epidemic continues for another decade or two, what do you see? Well, I, I started off being very, I don't know, a little apocalyptic. I have a little bit of that in me. And I thought, you know, the things have got to collapse. You can't, you can't think you're better than you are and operate your life from a, from a state of I'm better than I am. And, and not crash. And we find that in narcissistic relationships. We find it with narcissistic leadership. So we tend to find that with individuals. So I thought, well, the country's got to have a collapse and then a reset. And everybody's going to say, God, we just got a little crazy and it was great, but time to sober up and work hard and be more like the Canadians, you know? <laughs> and, and it never happened. We had the crash. 
And then we said, well, let's just print about $3 trillion and pretend everything's good. You know, and, and so we didn't really have any sort of reset. And you, instead- you Let a good crisis go to waste. Well, yeah. And instead what happened, I'm like, and then I think, well, all these people that don't have jobs anymore and have no future and are all educated, they're gonna march on Washington like in Greece and they're gonna demand, they're gonna demand things change. They didn't do that. I was wrong. Instead, they started going, I'm going, to, I'm going to live in my mom's basement, and I'm going to spend more time on the internet, and I'm going to get a pseudonym on World of Warcraft, and I'm going to dress up like a bunny rabbit, or I'm going to dress up like a, like a Star Wars trooper and go to Dragon Con. Well, okay, and but some of them went to Zuccotti Park, and some of them were the 99%. Fifteen. And uh, Fifteen of them playing hacky sack. I mean, compared to the U.S. to Greece, <laughs> I, I mean, it, what, hap what we're having is, I mean, I think of this as the great fantasy migration. We have this huge number of, of young people, but all people of all ages are migrating through some sort of virtual world or fantasy world and getting a lot of esteem through that and seem to be almost leaving. I mean, this is what I'm looking at right now hmm. in research. So rather than fight back, they yeah. actually indulged in their narcissism even more. Yeah, just just move into another sphere where you can you can sort of operate, and so I'm wondering if that's the future. Just massive wealth, just you know, disparity, and a bunch of people dressed up as Star Wars. Let let's let's hope that there's a more optimistic look in the future. Let's hear it. In which case, how would you propose to treat this narcissism epidemic? Well, I think there's a you know sort of big picture. You look at the problem. I mean. One, one is, let's just get rid of the self-esteem stuff. I mean, I think that's easy. It's just, we know it's, it doesn't work, and, and let's just forget about that. So that's easy. But the big things that seem to be antidotes for narcissism, one is compassion, civic engagement, any sort of connection. So any, any way you can th make people want to connect to others in a positive way, care about other people, it's, you know, bringing that up seems to be useful. Um, the second is is passion. Um, when people are really passionate about what they do, when they're, when they're deeply engaged in what they do, narcissism goes away on its own. I mean, people, you know, people get, they love whatever, they love collecting coins. They go, hey, Steve, check out my coins. It's not about how cool they are, it's like they're really excited about the coins and want to share that with you. And the third is just responsibility. I mean, fiscal responsibility, responsibility for your family, responsibility for your community which spells, somebody said CPR, which sounds good, but I, <laughs> I didn't think about that. Um, Wait a minute, say those things again. Yeah, compassion, compassion, pa passion, passion, responsibility. Responsibility, hey. I think those you are got the big there. ones. And, and the other thing, I, I'm a big believer in is natural consequences. And you get that in nature a lot. You go out hiking or you, you know, you're in Canada, you're out there on a, you know, outdoors in the winter and you get hit by a storm, nothing, you, you've just got to survive. There's no, it's not about how good you are. And nature just tells you how you're doing. Um, and any way, you, any way we can institute more natural consequences. So when people make mistakes, they actually, the mistakes happen. That makes people function better. Um, Last couple of minutes here, let me try this with you, W. Keith Campbell. You're getting a lot of attention for the work that you've done on this subject for the last five or six years. You're on TV, yeah. getting invited to conferences to speak, published, all of this kind of stuff. These are all the, these are all the things that um, could make somebody, if he were so inclined, more narcissistic because you're getting a lot of attention for all of this yeah. stuff. So are you? Yeah, no, I, I'm, uh, no, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, it's the idea. It's like when, when uh, John Edwards, one of our presidential candidates, was caught having a love child when his wife had cancer. And um, you say that like it's a negative thing. Yeah, no, no, it's a love child. It's not a anything bad. Um, and, and he said, you know, I, I was this normal guy with a sixty thousand foot house, and and then I became senator, and people started looking up to me, and I became narcissistic. I don't, I don't no. really think that was the case. He was there already. I think he was there. I, um, I, I guess it, I'm not very narcissistic, but I, I really work at trying not to be because as soon as you, first of all, there's a lot of people who are a lot more important than you on every aspect. And secondly, people don't really like narcissists. They like meeting them, but they don't really like them. They won't, don't want relationships with them. And third, it just seems, it's sort of, like I said, I think it interferes with enjoying life. 
if you're sort of looking at yourself all the time rather than just experiencing life. If you're aware enough to know that this is an issue and therefore I better do something to make sure I'm not, that's probably a good indication that you're not, right? I, I hope so, yeah. yeah I, I, so. I, I, you know, I, I have people who are narcissistic contact me occasionally and say, look, I know what's going on. How do I stop this? Hmm. Not very often, though. Most of the time, it's their significant other. Right. And the answer is CPR. CPR. <laughs> Compassion, passion, responsibility. I it's like that. That's not bad, is that it? That is not bad no, at all. You I mean, should go I with that. try, yeah. Keith, it's awfully good of you to spend the last couple of days with us. We've really enjoyed meeting you. And the name of the book, again, written a few years ago, but still an excellent read, The Narcissism Epidemic, by your co-author, Gene Twenge and W. Keith Campbell. Thanks so much for joining us here no, on TVO. Thanks for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.